You're listening to TIP. Hey, how's everyone doing out there? So one of our favorite types of episodes is the mastermind discussions. Uh, we hold these discussions about once a quarter and bring together some of the smartest people that we can find so we can talk about potential stock picks. So this week we have Hari Ramachandra, who's an executive from LinkedIn uh, in Silicon Valley. And we also have John Huber, who's a very smart value investor that runs Sabre Capital Management and a popular investing blog called Base Hit Investing. So we really had a lot of fun uh, during this week's uh, recording. And this episode was actually split into two weeks because uh, we ran so long on each person's individual stock pick. So the purpose of these deep dives during our mastermind discussions is to give the audience an idea of what investors should be looking for when trying to make an investment decision. Uh, that's what it's really about. It's more about the process and how we're thinking about things. And as you'll see, we're trying to determine the intrinsic value of each pick while also identifying the potential risks of owning it and whether that intrinsic value can actually materialize. So, In this Mastermind episode, we'll be discussing two very untraditional stock picks, where we usually look at stocks that have dropped in price and thereby look to be attractive in value. We are kind of doing the opposite today. The first one has more than doubled in the last few years in price, and the other one more than quadrupled in price. Let's hear if the group thinks that this might still be a good buying opportunity. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. All right. Awesome to be back with you guys. We have assembled the mastermind group and uh, we got a couple changes this week because Toby Carlisle's out. He wasn't able to make it. He had something that popped up. Colin's out this week. So we had brought on a newcomer here that we uh, found out about just recently. Well, at least Stig and I did. His name is John Huber and he is the portfolio manager for Sabre Capital Management. And he's also has a really popular blog. It is called Base Hit Investing. I'm sure most of our audience knows about your blog, John. It was funny because Hari got on the net and he just started talking to John here whenever we all got connected. And of course, those two already know each other because Hari, you know, he works at LinkedIn, so he knows everybody. He's connected to everybody. So uh, Hari Ramachandra from Bits Business is with us. And of course, Stig and myself, we're ready to do this. So Thanks, guys, for making time to come on for the Mastermind discussion, and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Likewise. All right. So what we're going to do is, like we said in the introduction, we're going to be covering our number one pick that we're kind of seeing in our filters and what we're coming up with that we think might be a viable investment opportunity, even though the market is very high, <laughs> sky-high pricing right now. Schiller PE is at about a 30, so the S&P might be priced around a 3 or 4% return very high, but we're going to talk about an individual pick and everyone's going to kind of shoot holes through the other person's pick and, and their idea. So we're going to kick this off with John. He's the newbie. So he has to go first. You're first in the shoot, John. Fire away. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having me on and Stig and Preston. I, I really enjoy the show. You guys do great work and your podcasts are always really informative and Always a lot of fun to listen to. So I appreciate you letting me uh, tag along on this one. So I'm going to talk about Tencent Holdings, which is one of the stocks I own for my investors at Sabre Capital. And very quickly before that, I thought what might be interesting is I'll uh, preface this with a few general comments that I think relate in some ways specifically to this investment and then more generally to my investment philosophy. So first off, I've always noticed that there is somewhat of an aversion, I guess, that you could say, or maybe an indifference among the value investing community toward investing in large cap stocks. And obviously, 10 cents a large cap stock. And I've written about this numerous times on my site and in some of my investor letters. But I think it's interesting to know how much large cap stocks actually do fluctuate. And even in the last year, which is one of the lowest volatility years in the past quarter century or so, the average gap between the 52-week high and the 52-week low among the 10 mega cap stocks, the average gap was 40%. So even among those massive companies, these are you know companies like Apple and Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Exxon and those types of companies, and even consumer staple companies like Johnson & Johnson, the average 52-week high is 40% greater than the average 52-week low. So 
fluctuations obviously provide an opportunity. And then in terms of my approach to investing, I focus on good businesses. I'm trying to make investments in quality companies when their stock prices are undervalued. I look for things like predictable earning power and high returns on capital, good management. And then I try to just patiently wait until there's an inevitable opportunity that the market offers you know, from time to time. So sometimes these opportunities are in smaller companies and sometimes they're in some of the more mature, larger companies that have predictable cash flow and then just occasionally get mispriced by the market. So I look for investments of all sizes. You know, Some are large, some are small, but I probably prefer the smaller ones because there are more, I think, inefficiencies there. But I'm just explaining these thoughts to try to demonstrate that you know, just because a company is large doesn't necessarily mean it can't be undervalued. So with that background, I'll discuss a large cap stock. It's a well-followed company. And as I mentioned, that's Tencent Holdings, ticker is T-C-E-H-Y. So Tencent's a internet holding company in China. It's got a variety of different businesses, all of which are benefiting immensely from the rapid rise of the Chinese consumer and the expanding middle class there. It's a really incredible company. Tencent's got a lot of investments in many different areas. I categorize the largest businesses, or at least the businesses that are, are large right now and I think have a lot of potential going forward as video game publishing, mobile advertising, e-commerce, mobile payments, and music and video subscriptions. So collectively, these are great businesses. Most of them take very little capital to grow. Some take more than others, of course. But on balance, these are really high return on capital businesses and produce solid free cash flow, and they're growing rapidly. The company did about $28 billion in revenue last year and did about $10 billion in free cash flow in the last 12 months. And so it's highly profitable, of course, and top and bottom line are growing at uh, about 40 to 50% annually at the current time. So it's an interesting company with a lot of great businesses in attractive markets, lots of growth potential. The company has aspects of numerous companies that we're familiar with in the West all under one roof. So it's got aspects of Facebook, it's got aspects of WhatsApp, YouTube, PayPal, Apple Music, all rolled into one. And on top of that, it's the world's largest video game publisher as well. So a lot of great businesses. The crown jewel of the company, in my opinion, is, and this is also the reason for wanting to own the stock, and it's also one of the widest moats in the world, I think, and that's WeChat. And so many refer to WeChat as the super app. It's one of the most powerful networks, as I said, and there are just, just under a billion users now. WeChat is primarily in China, almost exclusively in China. It started to expand a little bit, but mostly in China. And what's amazing about that statistic is basically everybody in China is on WeChat. And it's really unlike anything that we've seen in the West, and it's used for just about everything in everyday life in China. So on the surface, what is WeChat? WeChat's an app for your phone, but unlike most apps, it's really a collection of different apps. It's called mini programs that all exist inside of WeChat. So there, there are all these apps within WeChat that allow you to perform all different kinds of everyday functions like calls, text messages. You know, people don't send text via SMS, they send messages via WeChat. They don't make phone calls in some cases, they just call through WeChat. There's a social network really similar to Facebook. WeChat's used for work communication. You know, people don't send email as much anymore, especially in the larger tier one cities. They just communicate via WeChat. So it started as a communication tool, but then it also blossomed into this monster app that today, what's interesting is WeChat added the ability to make mobile payments, and that really created a whole new, it took the app to a, a different level. Now people can use WeChat for everyday payments. You can help cabs on WeChat. You can pay for movies on WeChat. You can buy goods online. You can make payments in physical stores. And basically anything that involves a commercial transaction can be used through WeChat. And WeChat Pay is actually now one of the larger mobile payments platforms in China. It's the second largest behind Alipay. And it's rapidly taking market share. I think it's up to close to 40% market share in China now. So it's it's a really incredible platform that has a strong network. You know, a billion users attract a lot of businesses. There are now, I think, 300,000 businesses that accept payments via WeChat. So it's a very powerful network that continues to grow. And people spend a lot of time on the app. What's interesting is 
people spend more time on WeChat and people spend on Facebook and Instagram combined. And also along those lines, one of the most incredible statistic, I think, is that over one third of WeChat users spend four hours or more on this single app. So it's it's a really powerful app that has an incredible grab among users. And that, of course, attracts a lot of businesses that want to sell things to those users. One more statistic that I'll point to try to demonstrate the growth potential. Facebook did about $2 billion in advertising. And we all know how good the economics are at Facebook. This past year, they did $27 billion in revenue and $10 billion in cash flow. In 2010, two years before they went public, they did about $2 billion in revenue. And so the company went from $2 billion to $27 billion in the last six or seven years. And that's almost all online advertising and a large portion of that is mobile advertising. So I think there's an enormous potential for a platform like WeChat, which I think you could make an argument actually has more pricing power than Facebook has. So all in all, I think it's one of the best companies in the world. I think sizable cash flow, really strong network effect, plenty of room for growth in uh, industries like mobile advertising, mobile payments, e-commerce. And Tencent has, as I said, a small fraction of those markets. So the stock's up a lot this year. It looks expensive on the surface at around 40 times earnings. That's the 40 times the amount of cash flow that I think the company will produce this year. But I think it could actually still be undervalued. And the reason is that if you forget about the size of the market cap, which usually becomes an anchor at this size, it's $400 billion, and you just look at the company's earning power and you look at the returns on incremental capital that it produces and again the growth potential that it has i think you can make a case that the company will continue to grow its earnings and its intrinsic value and i think the stock price will likely correspond more or less to those gains in earning power and gains in intrinsic value over time so you know sometimes 40 pe is expensive usually it is and you know i think in rare cases it, it can be cheap so, John, could you tell us more about the valuation? You mentioned that it looks somewhat expensive right now. You're also talking about growth rates, top line, bottom line, call it 40%. You know, it's aggressive to project that. It has done so in the past. That looks like there's a lot of earning power to be gained, especially in the digital marketing in China. How do you make a model? How do you make your projections of the future cash flows whenever you justify the current valuation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the way I do valuation is usually back of the envelope. I don't have any, you know, detailed spreadsheets or models or anything, but I just think about the company's earning power now and the amount of cash flow it's producing now, and then I try to think about what the returns on capital look like. And the company is a complicated beast. I mean, it's it's investing in lots of different passive investments. You know, it took a 5% stake in Tesla, for example. It owns a piece of Activision, which is a, you know, video game publisher here in the US, and it has all different kinds of equity investments, which are passive. And so some of the capital gets diverted towards those investments. And so you sort of have to make a view about how good you think the company is as a capital allocator. And so that's maybe a question mark. I'm not sure how good of an investor Pony Ma is, the manager, but I think over time, the core businesses at Tencent are so good and the runways are so great that I think there's a long potential ahead for the company to grow. So just as a, a note to the uh, listeners, we first came in contact with John because I sent out a tweet. This was, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago, two weeks ago or something. I sent out a tweet. Hey, does anyone know much about Tencent, which is the company we're talking about? And I think I had maybe 10 people reply to me in the matter of like a half hour. You need to talk to John Huber. You got to talk to John Huber. Everyone was like throwing your name out there as the guy to talk to about Tencent America. And, you know, whenever I'm digging into this, I initially like all of this because of all the reasons that you're saying. I totally understand the WeChat argument. I think that it's a much bigger moat than most people in America might give it credit for because everyone's so Facebook centric here in America. But when you go over to China and you see what everyone's using, it is WeChat a thousand times over. I would argue that maybe it's even stronger than Facebook is here in the US. So I'm with you. I completely agree with that. When I look at the financials, and I see the free cash flow on this thing. I mean, it's a freaking beast. And when you look at the top line to the free cash flow, I mean, it's a huge margin. I mean, it's massive. So like, this is the type of business that, you know, all of us really like to own. The issue that I have really goes to the heart at what Stig was getting at, which is what are we using as the growth rate moving forward? Because that is what it all comes down to here as far as the valuation on it. And when you look at the last 10 years, let's just talk about the, okay. 
last 10 years, the free cash flow, not the top line, but the free cash flow grew at 58% annually for the last 10 years. Just in the last year alone, it was 44% free cash flow growth. So these are like massive numbers. And so whenever I'm, I've got my model, my intrinsic value model here, and I'm putting in some of these numbers, if I put in a 30% growth rate for the free cash flow into the next 10 years annually, 30%, 30% for the next 10 years, I'm getting a 11.9% return. So we'll call it a 12% return if you buy it at today's price of $41 a share. But you have to get 30% every year on the free cash flow growth. If I adjust that down, let me just adjust it down to 20%, which I think is a much more conservative number. I think that, is this in the realm of possible? Yeah, but I would probably put the probability, I don't know. I definitely wouldn't say it's 100% that they're going to get 20% annually for the next 10 years. But let's just see what we get for our intrinsic value here. So if I put 20% growth for the next 10 years, I'm now getting an intrinsic value of around 6%. So drastic difference in the intrinsic value, the return at the current price of $41. If you buy at $41 and you have 20% annual growth on the free cash flow for the next 10 years, I'm estimating that you're going to get an IRR of about 6.3%. So that's where I, I guess I get a little concerned, especially as I feel like when we look at the global economy and we see that we're going to have a credit event here in the next 10 years. That's going to happen within 10 years. I have close to 100% confidence that that's going to happen in the next 10 years. If that happens, I just don't see how they're going to be able to hit a free cash flow growth rate as high as 30% plus. I guess I have such a hard time buying that. And I really liked your comment, John, because you said, this is one to watch. If you're not comfortable with the price today, it's something to watch because you know, in, in a year or two or three years, you might be presented with an incredible opportunity to buy this company at a fantastic price because their economic moat is so huge. And I totally agree with that. I just don't know if I'm a buyer today, but I love the fact that we're talking about this company because this is a very high quality company. Yeah. I think obviously the current growth rates, although they have remained high, in fact, in some cases actually accelerated slightly in recent quarters, but you know, obviously you can't grow at 40% for very long because the Chinese economy is only so large. But the Chinese economy is very large, and the industries that they operate in are so large. One of the things that Bezos talked about in his recent letter to Amazon shareholders was how important it is to focus on these big trends, he called them, I think, like these big external fundamental trends that are sweeping you know, major economies. And I think he talked about like artificial intelligence. But you know, the way I took that was, you know, look for these broad, sweeping fundamental trends because as he said, they give you a tailwind and you don't want to fight those trends. One of the, the trends that I think the company benefits from is the rapid rise of the middle class. And if you look at the numbers and the sheer volume of people joining the middle class in China each year, the numbers are really astounding. I mean, they're, they're going to add like an entire U.S. population to the middle class in the next four or five or six years or so. So there's a lot of buying power. And as those customers come into the middle class and get more connected to the internet, spend more time on their mobile phones, buy more things, you know, Tencent is really well positioned to capitalize on that. The other thing I'd say is I think you have to think about Tencent, and this is always a little bit, maybe it's a red flag that I'm saying this, but I think you have to think about the company differently than we would analyze most you know, most companies, I'd say most traditional companies, but Tencent is such a unique animal because not only is WeChat unique and unlike anything that we've seen, but the company itself has its tentacles in all these different businesses. You know, it has 118 million subscribers, paying subscribers to various, you know, news subscriptions and online video and music. And, you know, when you compare it to Netflix with 94 million subs, it's that's a pretty big business that's tucked inside this massive conglomerate and not many people know about it. The video game business is obviously producing a good share of the profit right now and a good share of the revenue. But I guess my point is, I think there's a lot of white space that people might underestimate. And so I think the growth is not going to continue at these rates, I don't think for certainly not for 10 years, because the numbers would be astronomical at that point. But I think the growth can be you know, 15 to 20% for a long period of time. And the valuation that the market places on that might not be 40 times earnings, but 
you know, this is a capital light business that I think will be valued at, depending on where interest rates go and general valuations go, I think it's going to achieve a premium valuation because of the quality of the business. And I do think that earnings can grow for quite a long time at not 40%, but, you know, maybe even half that would give you a pretty nice return over time. John, thank you for sharing your views on 10 cents. And uh, just to add to what Priston said, I was one of the folks who tweeted him within the half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you putting me on here. <laughs> yeah, so I've been a big fan and a longtime reader of your blog. And I also want to highlight the fact that uh, one of your bets, the probably is one of your significant bet is Apple. Your strike price might be in the 90s and today it's 165 for folks. John was very modest when he was talking about his performance. So a couple of questions regarding Tencent's now, WeChat, as you said, is a phenomenal. I've seen that making inroads even into US and Europe. However, from a risk perspective, a couple of things that I wanted to clarify is, even though Tencent is making foray into mobile payments and advertising, business to business and customer to business, B2C, one observation is that more than half of their revenue still comes from gaming. And gaming is a kind of a low mode e business because you know, the trends change. So that's number one risk. Number two risk I would like you to address is the regulatory risk in China because of Tencent's foray into payment system like VPay or TenPay. And recently, I think in March 2014 or sometime around that, the Central Bank of China suspended virtual credit card and barcode scanning for mobile payments and stuff like that. So they're kind of hostage to the regulations changing in terms of their payment. So I wanted to get your thoughts on these two risks. How significant are they for Tencent? And what are some of the steps that Tencent is taking to address them? One of the ways I think they're addressing it is, you know, just recently, the Chinese government is an interesting, when you think about the competitor to Tencent, in some ways, I think the Chinese government could be the biggest competitor it has, because it really has no equal when it comes to you know, the, the platform that's WeChat. And I think in a market economy, if it were a, you know, a complete market economy as opposed to a planned economy, I think the growth would be much more certain. One of my questions is how big will the party allow this company to be? How much money will they allow it to make? And one of the risks is, you know, that the government basically goes to guys like Tencent and Alibaba and JD and say, look, you guys have benefited from all of these investments that we've made in IT and building out you know, the infrastructure that allows you guys to provide your services to the users that you have. And so we're going to force you to invest in China Unicom, for example, which is one of the state-owned telecom companies that recently there was a deal announced and there's some complications going on right now, but it looks like Tencent and Alibaba and JD and a couple other tech companies and a couple other companies are going to basically make an equity investment in that company to help finance the 4G expansion and the potential 5G expansion and so forth. So, you know, one of the risks is that they just go to these cash rich companies and use them as piggy banks to sort of finance the growth that the country will certainly need. And, you know, there's a lot of debt in China right now. There's a lot of government debt and there's potential issues there. And I think there'll be a lot of bumps in the road, but my overarching view is that China is trending from a planned economy toward more of a market economy. And there's going to be bumps in the road and there might be, you know, kind of cycles that sort of work against that. Xi Jinping, this is an election year in China and Xi is accumulating power and a lot of people are concerned about that and rightly so. And I think so in some ways they might be temporarily moving away from that. But I think in general, the country is getting more capitalistic. You know, if you look out 20 or 30 years, that's going to continue. And I think these big companies are in some ways on the other side of the coin viewed as like national champions in China that, you know, China wants these companies to do well. They want Alibaba to do well and expand overseas. And they, they'd they like to see Chinese company, I think, I mean, I think they'd like to see Chinese companies make inroads into Europe and make inroads into the U.S. market and potentially compete with companies like Amazon and others that dominate you know, the rest of the world. So I do think it's becoming more globalized. And I think these companies will continue to do well. But you certainly outlined a risk and certainly, you know, a risk that you have to think about and address. 
So I know that soccer is probably not like a, a big sports there for my uh, American friends, but soccer is a, is a huge deal here in Europe. And one of the interesting things that had happened since Xi Jinping, uh, the Chinese president, came into power is that a lot of money is flowing into Chinese soccer at the moment. So many of the best players, they're just simply going to China because they can make more money. And if you track where the money is coming from, it's not coming from the government. It's coming from its massive corporate investments. And whenever I saw that, I was thinking, this doesn't make any sense. Why would corporations pay so much to see good soccer players? I mean, what's that all about? It's simply such a huge prestige project from the president to have a really good football league because they want to do good at the World Cup. So what the corporations are doing is that they are buying these players, not so much just so they can enjoy them play, but simply to gain favor with the government. And it just tells me something about the culture and the, I guess, the unpredictability. Not so much in the sense, the way that the Chinese system works, because you typically when you're president or your secretary of the Communist Party, you'll be sitting there for a long time. And the underlying basis of the unity is the same in China. But each president has his own prestige projects that they're just throwing so much money after. So my question to you for the political consideration would be, what's the relationship and what can you see go wrong specifically about this company? Is that something we should be extra worried about? Or is there some kind of history, which is very important in the Chinese culture, that can give you more stability than otherwise would? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think the relationship between Tencent and the government, from what I can tell, has been good. And I think Tencent has, for the most part, I think, done things to try to certainly abide by the rules, but abide by the spirit and the preferences that the party has. There have been some bumps in the road, and there probably will be in the future. I mean, just recently, there have been some censorship questions. Weibo, which is kind of the Chinese version of Twitter, had some real issues, and there are some potential censorship issues there. And WeChat has been named as one of the uh, entities, along with Weibo and, and others, that the Chinese government is now investigating to crack down on, I guess, slander against the party and other issues that just occur on social media that the Chinese government doesn't like. Certainly, criticism of the Chinese government isn't tolerated there. So all of those things, I think, are they're things I've thought about myself. They're difficult to handicap, and I don't think you can really place precise you know, odds on how those things will work. But I have gained a comfort level that I think Tencent's position in that economy and its importance via the assets that it owns, specifically WeChat, are so crucial at this point to the economy and consumer culture that I think in general, I think the Chinese government understands that. And I think a lot of the incentives are aligned there. You don't want to upset the apple cart too much when it comes to WeChat because you're going to have a billion people that are really upset. Now, there's some things that you know the Chinese government can do outside of shutting down WeChat or you know limiting WeChat or censoring WeChat somehow. And they're, they're doing censorship right now on certain platforms. But, you know, there are economic things like I talked about with the China Unicom investment. You know, they can go to these guys and basically extort them for money, you know, if they want to in, in certain ways or force them to make investments that they wouldn't make, you know, if they had their own complete free will. So all of those things are things that you have to consider. And those are things you just kind of have to kind of handicap on your own. But they are risks. You know, Stig, when I think through your question, which I think is a really good question, because we've seen so many Western companies try to go to China and it just always turns out to be a disaster. Whenever I look at this, the fact that the origin of the company is Chinese and that it's grown from that foundation, I think says that brings a lot more comfort to me personally. If that was a risk that I was concerned about, I have a lot more confidence knowing that it originated as a Chinese company and it's grown into this large holding company than if it was Yahoo that went over there with a new product, had competed really vigorously and done well, I'd be much more concerned about that because the roots were tied back to some Western or some other country outside of China. So I guess for me, personally, that's how I'd be looking at it. I don't know if John would agree with that. but Yeah. I mean, the other thing, Preston, is the Chinese firewall. I mean, basically, internet companies in large part haven't been allowed to come into China. Some have tried and gotten kicked out or some have tried and failed. And even retail companies like Amazon has, I think, you know, one and a half percent market share. 
in China. So it's very difficult for outside companies to do business there. And there are laws that basically restrict foreign ownership of certain companies, which has resulted in the corporate structures that some of these companies have. But basically, yeah, I would agree that I think the government would prefer, certainly when it comes to IT and banking, mobile payments, probably e-commerce, you know, these, these are industries that the government wants Chinese homegrown companies to dominate the market there. All right, guys. So we got through one company and so we're doing well here. <laughs> Stig, did you want to go next? Sure. So my stock pick is Fiat Chrysler and the stock ticker is FCAU. And this stock first came on my radar because it was one of Moni's PubRise picks. And uh, PubRise, he bought the stock at around three of cars and now it's trading around 15. As you can all see, I'm a very, very slow learner. Whenever I, I saw the, uh, the company, you know, it was kind of doing a turnaround. It, it has its, its structure that it has now since uh, 2014. The brands that most people are probably familiar with Alfa Romeo, Chrysler, Jeep, Dutch, Fiat, obviously, Maserati, more expensive car, and then also Ram trucks. Since that, they have the new structure. They've also been spinning off Ferrari back in 2015. They were settled in early 2016. If you look at how the company is making money, where they make the revenue, 80% of the revenue is in NAFTA and then also in, in Europe. In NAFTA, they are the fourth biggest with a 12.6% market share after GM, Ford, and Toyota. Uh, Europe, somewhat smaller, only 6.5% market share, where they're trailing Volkswagen. It's a very uh, competitive industry. It's characterized in general by somewhat smaller margins. It's typically an industry you wouldn't like. It's, uh, it's capital intensive, and unionized labor, a lot of bad stuff uh, for, for many value investors when they look at this. If you dig even deeper into uh, where the money is made, not just the revenue, almost all the money or the income, they're made in, the, in NAFTA. They're expanding. So they're big, they're big in Europe, but they're also expanding into other continents, but uh, they're really not making any money there. And so we're recording this at the end of, uh, of August. And as people probably already know, there's been a lot of rumors about Fiat Chrysler, about perhaps selling off the, the Jeep division to uh, Great Wall Motors. We also, there's also rumors about Maserati and Alfa Romeo brand uh, spun off. So a, a lot of things are happening right now and there's a lot of noise uh, right now. The, the stock has been soaring uh, lately. I'm, I'm really sorry that, that we have to do the uh, discussion now and probably not just a quarter ago when, when the stock was a lot more attractive. If we look at the valuation, we're looking at a market cap around $29 billion. I always like to compare this to Tesla. Every time we talk cars on the show, Presta and I always talk about Tesla, which is sort of weird because Presta and I are a huge fan of Elon Musk and of Tesla cars. We just always pass the valuation. So, so $29 billion for Fiat Chrysler, $58 billion for Tesla. If you look at how much money they're making, for instance, Fiat Chrysler, they're making 3.3 billion USD, trailing 12 months. And Tesla they're making a negative 766 million. So they're definitely valued differently. A lot of good reason why they're valued differently. I think a lot of people would say Tesla is the future. The red flag with Fiat Chrysler is that they really haven't seen a good plan for electrical car division. Uh, what they're going to do about that. It's another concern that we can address later. And in general, the industry has just had a really rough time. I mean, you can also look at something like GM as a good example, bankrupt in 2009. I mean, so all the competitors, the traditional competitors, they're trading at low margins. I don't necessarily see a lot of top line growth, even though I expect some, because it really also depends on how much is the business selling off, how much is it perhaps spinning off. I see a lot of the value also coming from improved margins. So I still see the company as significantly undervalued. Perhaps if you aggregate all the different factors, an intrinsic value in the range between called 25 and $40 in its current structure. So before I give the rest of my pitch, I'm very curious to hear what the group has to say. I guess I'm just looking at the valuations on this one a little bit different than Stig. So the, my big concern with the whole car industry is the inventory levels are just through the roof. I mean, they're, they've got, they're sitting on so much inventory, it's absolutely insane. 
when I'm looking at this company in particular, and you were talking earlier when we were talking about John's pick, you were talking about these tailwinds of like, hey, what's the next 10 years going to look like? In 10 years from now, if we could warp ourselves, what's it going to look like? Well, I think the driverless car thing is going to be huge. I think it's going to be absolutely massive. If you go on and you do a Google search for Fiat Chrysler, you know, driverless car technology, anything, you, you practically get nothing. They're just sitting back and watching this, this thing go completely by. I guess they did some teaming with BMW for whatever that means. But for the most part, from what I can understand, they're so far behind this, this learning curve, it's not even funny. When I think about the margins that are going to happen in the auto industry in the future, I think that all the money is going to be in the software side, not on the hardware side. And I think that there's going to be a very massive delineation of that moving forward into the next 10 years where you're going to have these car companies that have tons of software that is adding huge amounts of value. We could get into the whole argument of time sharing cars 10 years from now. I don't find it to be that too far fetched to think that you might be able to get out of your car and then that car can go and perform a service for the rest of the day. I did a little uh, research on this one for the stats here. The average person uses their car for 46 minutes in a day. That means that you're using, you're paying for a vehicle, you're paying for maintenance, the liability, the storage, the fuel costs, the insurance, all that stuff, the depreciation that happens at 60% over a five year period. You're paying for all that to use something for 3% of the day. And I think that that's all going to change. I think in 10, 15 years, that's all going to change. And I think you're going to have timeshares with cars and all that kind of stuff. Where is that going to happen? Which companies are going to be on the tip of that? When I look at that, I think Apple, they're sitting on just ridiculous amounts of money to invest. Google, ridiculous amounts of money to invest. And when you think about the technology that a company like Fiat Chrysler brings to the table. What what technology are they bringing? Like technology from like 50 years ago? Is that what they're bringing to the table? Because that's how I see it, which is completely a commodity. Whenever I'm looking at this, I think the best case scenario for me when I'm talking valuation is a 0% growth in their free cash flow and then into the next 10 years. I would say 0% growth. So with the 0% growth, the numbers I'm getting is a 6.4% return. I think that's being nice to say it's a 0% growth. If I was going to really kind of hit it with a much more conservative number, I would say negative 10% annual growth on the free cash flow. And if we're using that as, as the number here for the projection, we're now below a 1% return on the company. So between, so let's just, you know, ballpark it. We'll say it's between the first number and the second number. We're looking at a 3% return, which is similar to the S and P 500. So for me, I'm not willing to go into individual stock pick that seems like they're going against the headwind. You know, my risk isn't distributed across 500 picks. If I would just invest in the S and P 500, I'm not for this one at all. Stig. I, I just, I'm seeing it completely different than you. No, but that's great. I need to know why I'm wrong. That's why we have these mastermind discussions. Hari, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about Fiat Chrysler. Do you think it's a good pick? So uh, I just wanted to clarify, and I also had a follow-up question stake on this one. So you mentioned Australian Monish Pobrai bought the stock uh, back like in 2012 or 13, I believe. And uh, his, his strike price was $3. Yeah, yeah. He said that he, uh, he bought into the stock when it was less than a market cap of $5 billion. And right now it's trading around 30. And that was before Ferrari was spun off what was the intention or what was his thesis to buy? I don't think Manish is betting on the long-term prospect of this company when he's buying the stock. It's a value pick. The stock has grown from in the last four years at a annual growth rate of around 50%. If you look at the growth rate, whereas the You're revenue talking, has grown. Uh, Hari, just to interrupt you. You're talking the price has grown at 50%. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. The yeah. price, the price of the stock has grown at annual, like from $3 to $15, four years, it's 50% annually. Whereas the revenue has grown around 7% per year from 83, 84 to 100 and people extent, I guess. So my question to you was, so based on your analysis, What's the catalyst that has driven the, the price increase? Is it just the earning expansion? Is, is it just a multiple expansion, like the PE multiple expansion? Or was there something fundamentally that changed in the past three, four years 
due to what the management did or due to certain conditions that industry in this short term. And I agree with Kristen on the long term prospects. It's really hard to say how Fiat Chrysler will do. But in the short term, I want to know what change in these three to four years. And, and Hari, uh, I'm jumping in here because you asked this to stick, but I'm, I'm right there with you because Monish saw then back then. Because when I'm looking at the free cash flow of this business back whenever he would have bought this, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like I would have never jumped into the pick because when you're looking at the free cash flow, it was a disaster. It was all over the place. So what was he seeing back then that made him jump into this? I got the same question as you. Yeah, you're definitely right. And I just have to bring up again that the structure you see now, that's only been in place since 2014. So you can't necessarily use all the numbers that you see before. And to answer the question about what it, was it that Monish saw, and I think he saw a lot of tailwind in the car industry. And Monish was very aware of the management and what they did. And they launched a five-year plan on May 6, 2014. Now, the interesting thing is that the management has really followed the plan and really met all the goals. Now, they have updated the plan as they went along because it made a lot of sense. For instance, they realized that uh, Jeeps was a lot more attractive than original thought. For instance, the Jeep brand sold 1.4 million vehicles last year. It's not necessarily a bad idea. I also see this as the management being dynamic and adapt to the environment. They have done really, really well in that regard. And they had some very specific plans about the debt that when you look at it back in time, it looks horrible with the debt burden that they have, but they're actually being able to pay that debt off according to plan. So originally they raised a lot of debt so they could expand and so far it's turned out really, really well. It's definitely not bad at all. Uh, for instance, from 2018, uh, operating margin, the goal is 7%. I think there's a good chance that they can reach that. It's now at 5.1%. And clearly this looks good coming from a climate of almost uh, no margins at all. And I think the, the best way to explain the effect of a cyclical stock would be to say, and I'm just making up these, these numbers, but say that you have an EPS of, of $1 and it's something that the market doesn't like, so you will value that at a PE of three. And now you increase your earnings to four. So going from EPS of $1 to $4. Now, when the market sees that and they see the initiatives put in place to do that, they might value that EPS of four with a PE of eight. This might sound like an extreme example, but that's how you would go from a stock price of $3 to $32 even though that your EPS only increased four times. And that is the power of a cyclical stock if you can time it right, which is obviously the hard thing. It is really hard to do any kind of timing. And I also agree with both of you, and it might seem a bit too late that I'm mentioning it now, but I don't necessarily see Fiat Chrysler as something that I would hold for the next, call it 10 years. I think it's a short-term plan, almost like a special situation perhaps which is kind of like a curse word, I guess, when you're really be following this Warren Buffett approach that we talked a lot about, you know, only buying into companies you want to hold forever. I definitely don't plan to do that with this type of company. So is now a good time to invest or did someone like Moniz receive the gain that really was in this stock? You know, I don't think so. I think that he is rewarded for his foresight of this stock. But as you progress... And you can have more and more faith in the management. You can have more and more faith in the business. Clearly, the premium that you will be able to achieve uh, will be smaller. But I will also, it's called the certainty or at least the validity of the plan actually materializing is also so much higher. So for slow learners like me, we shouldn't be rewarded as much. But I still think there is more to gain. So you brought up the point about it being a cyclical. And I think that that was one of the reasons why I punished it so badly on the, my expectation for future cash flow is because when you go back and you look at the last credit contraction, accounting for the 08, 09, and you look at the free cash flow of the company, I mean, it just got punched in the face. So if we realistically think that that's going to happen over the next 10 years, which I do, I think that you're going to have that same type of fallout with their free cash flow. So if you're not accounting for that in your model, I think that you're just, you know, you're, you're not looking at it appropriately. And so that's probably one of the reasons why I'm so hard on where I think that they're going to be with their free cash flow moving forward is because I'm expecting another credit type event to occur. And I think it's going to be ugly for them. Yeah, it's definitely a good point. I mean, there's a variety of different factors that really influence the global demand. 
global GDP growth, for instance, that's one. Consumer confidence, that's another. And then credit. Credit is such a huge driver because primarily people buy cars with credit. And another point I'd just briefly like to talk about is how we talk about how AI or driverless cars, how that's really going to disrupt so many industries. I think it will happen, but also think that in the near future, there is a lot of value in a company like Fiat Chrysler because they have these valuable brands they can spin off. They're catering to a segment that might not welcome driverless cars too fast, and they have moved into more SUV Jeep focus with higher margins. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, a lot of the points that you guys have kind of, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of echo some of the concerns I have about the, the business itself. I've, I've looked at, sort of casually looked at the automakers. I've, every time I look at them, I, I just look at how difficult the business is when you look at the economics of the business. And Stig, you pointed this out. It's just a, it's an extremely capital intensive business. They tie up a lot of working capital. They tie up a lot of capital in fixed assets and their factories and equipment and and it's not only capital intensive, but it's very labor intensive. So it seems like every time the, the business begins to make money, you know, the unions come in and, and want a piece of that pie. And so it's very difficult to make lasting profits in this business through the cycle. The other thing that I've noticed, and I think you pointed this out, how, how good Marchione is at Chrysler but in general, it seems like the auto businesses are always so focused on defending their market share, and they're so focused on the top line. And I think a lot of it has to do with the culture. A lot of it has to do with uh, just, just the nature of the business. I think when you plan to when when you plan for SAR being at 17 million, and you have a certain amount of labor and a certain amount of production capacity at the moment, and a certain you know your your factories are running at at a certain tilt, and you you want to keep that going, and so you you get this cycle where manufacturers are so focused on just running cars through the assembly line and and sending them to the dealers and focused on top line and then you get this discounting environment and prices coming down and so it's it's a very difficult business ultra competitive but having said all that it it is interesting and you pointed this out about what Pabrai said but you know I was actually I heard an interview of uh, maybe a month or two ago with him and he talked about how he made fivefold return on his fiat investment. And I had to go back and check because I was really shocked by that, that his returns were so high investing in such a mediocre or, you know, some might say a, a kind of a lousy business. Ferrari spinoff was a big part of that. But it is interesting to, to look at cyclicals. And I don't really look at a lot of cyclical stocks, but I, I think there is a case to be made for investing in these types of stocks when you know, times are really bad when conditions are terrible. And, I, you know, Peter Lynch used to say this, that, you know, when times are bad, you want to buy or, you know, you want to buy cyclicals when times are bad and earnings are low and thus the P.E. ratios are actually high. One of the things that makes me a little nervous about the car companies right now is we're at or maybe not quite there, but, you know, just past the peak of the cycle potentially. And but we're near the peak and car companies are still running on, you know, near record profits and P.E. ratios are mid single digits. And so my concern is, you know, uh, where we are in that cycle and, you know, what the earning power looks like, you know, three or four years from now. John, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, going back to Hari's original question, what was Monish seeing that made him pounce on this at the exact right time? He was looking at this Peter Lynch idea of if you're going to invest in a cyclical, find the absolute best company in that field run by fantastic management that has the best financials that's being punished because it's going through this cyclical change and everyone hates it and buy it at that, at that moment. And, you know, when you look at when he would have done this, that's exactly what he was doing. The, you know, I, I read a, I think he, I think Mark Ione wrote a, a report called I think it was called Confessions of a Capital Junkie. Um, I may be getting the name of that wrong, but he basically wrote a paper. It was interesting because it showed me that he was cognizant of the natural problems or the, you know, the, the nature of his business, which is a very capital intensive business. And car companies produce low returns on capital. And his basic argument was, hey, we need scale so we can get together and, and share you know, share designs and maybe cut some of the workforce and 
you know, share some of the R and D expense and so forth. And so his argument was bulking up. What's interesting is they're kind of going the opposite route. And so I've been wondering, you know, as I read the, some of the parts, I, I saw an article in paper, I think last week about talking about the Jeep valuation and the argument was, was the same with Ferrari when they spun it off. And that's where out tremendously well for uh, Ferrari shareholders and Chrysler shareholders. But it seems like they're shrinking as opposed to bulking up and consolidating, which is what Marchioni's original you know, desire was. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point, John. And as most shareholders, I really like to see the company grow and prosper. But as an investor, I also think, what is the best financial result here? It might be to shrink because it really depends on the price. Not to bring in another sports metaphor, but it's sort of the same thing if you sell your star player. Is that a good deal? Well, it depends on a variety of factors. And one of the most important ones, that's the price. So can he be sold for more than his uh, his value? It might be so that even though it was not the intention, the best return you can get as an investor, that might be from seeing fair crisis shrink and thereby getting your return in the forms of special dividend or in shares in the spun of companies. All right, guys, that wraps up the first part of the Mastermind discussion. Stay tuned for next week's episode on the Investors Podcast, where we will discuss the stock picks that Preston and Nahari brought to the group. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thank <laughs> you.